Welcome to the Seeing is Believing Africa Region webinar. Thank you all for attending today. I know how busy everyone is and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. We have over 60 people registered from 15 countries in the region, which is absolutely fantastic. Also, a big thank you to our webinar presenters, Alice Moangi, the Country Manager for Operation Eyesight Universal Kenya, and Deborah Tigeri, the Country Representative for CBM Zimbabwe, for their willingness to share learning from their Seeing is Believing projects on the theme of sustainability. The agenda for the webinar will be, firstly, a brief introduction from me on housekeeping and sustainability in Seeing is Believing. Secondly, presentations from our two speakers, and each presentation will be approximately 15 minutes. And thirdly, I will chair a question and answer session after the two presentations. So the webinar will take one hour in total. Firstly, some housekeeping points. So I have currently shared my screen. So you should be able to see my screen. Uh, screen monitor clean. Um, which is basically just what the, the webinars are coming up. Um, so you should be able to view my computer screen through the GoToWebinar window. Each speaker will, I will share their screen during the presentation. I have forwarded you the PowerPoint presentations in advance and microphones are muted apart from the speakers as this just ensures a better quality webinar. We will be doing a question and answer session at the end, so if you have any questions for either of the presenters, please type them in the chat box. The chat box can be found on the right hand panel of your screen. You can post questions either during or after the presentations. My colleague John Trevlin is supporting us today with technical issues, so if you have any technical difficulties, for example with sound, you can send us a message in the chat box. Thank you, John, for your support today. It's a good idea to close down all other web applications, for example, Google, Outlook, Skype, to get a better quality of the call. And if you do have headphones, please use those as well. We've found from our practice runs that it just makes it, you can just hear a little bit clearer. I'm going to be recording this webinar and it will be uploaded onto the IPB website and I will send around the link in a few days. Finally, at the end of this Seeing is Believing webinar, I will be sending you a survey for your feedback. Okay, so the theme of this Seeing is Believing webinar is sustainability. So at SIB, what do we mean by sustainability? As you all know, Seeing is Believing is Standard Charter Bank's global initiative to tackle avoidable blindness and visual impairment in collaboration with the IPB and other NGOs and iCare organisations. The overall mission of Seeing is Believing is to create and strengthen sustainable eye care services in lower to middle income countries. Many Seeing is Believing projects have successfully impacted the following areas. Firstly, increase the accessibility and improve the quality of eye health service provision. Secondly, built the capacity of eye health facilities through the provision of infrastructure and human resource training. And thirdly, improve the knowledge, attitude and practices of communities regarding eye health through education. But it's important that the changes made by Seeing is Believing interventions are sustained post-project. So, the presentations today will explain some of the strategies Seeing is Believing projects have implemented or are still currently implementing to ensure sustainability of eye health programmes. Firstly, let me introduce Alice Mwengi, the Country Manager for Kenya from Operation Eyesight Universal. I'm now going to make Alice the presenter and she will take you through her presentation, but if you sort of bear with me a minute because I'm just, um, I need to switch the, uh, give her the controls basically. So thank you, Suzanne. So it's just, it just sort of takes us a, a minute or so just for, um, I've just handed Alice the control panel. So um, Alice, let me know when you're ready. Um, yes, thank you, Suzanne. Um, and welcome everybody. 
I'm glad to be here today. As you have heard, my name is Alice Mwangi and I work for Operation Eyesight as a country manager for Kenya. And I'm excited to be here today to talk about sustainability. So sustainability is critical and integral part of program design. And you'll agree with me that it is a terrible mistake to start thinking about how a project will be sustained at the end of it. So for us here in Operation Eyesight, um, sustainability is key to us. And I will attempt to demonstrate how sustainability has been entrenched in the SIB supported project in Kenya. So the term uh, sustainability in eye care is seen as the ability to maintain the benefits uh, achieved by prevention, uh, blindness prevention program long after the end of the program support. Um, while sustainability can be looked at from different angles and described using different components, my presentation will focus on sustainability in context of Operation Eyesight, uh, seen as believing supported project in Kenya. So the term sustain, um, so um, I will also focus on four areas when looking at sustainability. And the four areas are in health, management and information system, health financing, human resource for eye health, and lastly, supply chain. Um, but before that, allow me to give you a preview of CINIS Believing Project um, in Kenya. And this is a four-year project that started in the year 2014, and it will end in 2018. And as you can see from the presentation, the title of this project is uh, the Rift Valley Province Prevention of Blindness Program. And for those who do not know Kenya, actually this region is mainly on the eastern, western side of Kenya, and also part of the southern, I mean southern part of Kenya. And the goal of this uh, project is to contribute towards elimination of avoidable blindness in Kenya uh, by strengthening community outreach program. This project has three objectives. And the first one is on quality and that quality and sustainable eye care services are made available in the project area. Secondly, the project seeks to build the capacity of primary, secondary, and tertiary level facilities so that they are strengthened to provide quality services. Lastly, but not the least, the project um, focus on uh, integrating uh, primary eye care into general public health care. Um, So, so this project actually is embedded in the Kenya Ministry of Health um, health system and the county government uh, health system. And we work closely with seven secondary and one tertiary level hospitals as our partner hospitals. As listed below, um, namely Washungishu, Iten, Kapsabet, Kitale, Kapenguria, Narok. Naruso Rai is actually a satellite clinic of Narok, and Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. Just to highlight some of the project achievements, um, and uh, noting that we're in our third year of the project uh, implementation, uh, we have been able to screen more than 250,000 people. We have provided treatment for more than 200,000 people. We have done surgeries, uh, 20, about 23,000 surgeries. 8,358 of them are cataract surgeries. 
In terms of infrastructure development, we were able to, we were able to construct an I unit from scratch, and this I unit now is now operational and providing services. It's uh, fully equipped. We were able to identify uh, equipment gaps in the other six um, hospitals and provided equipment. And in terms of HR, human resource development, we were able to train 17 of public workers, six of whom are, are uh, cataract surgeons, and, and um, 11 of them are public nurses. So let me take you uh, through the components that I had earlier mentioned in regards to project sustainability. Um, Operation Eyesight does not run a, a parallel uh, health management uh, and information system, but we use partners HMIS to extract our report to the use of a tool that we share with them. And this tool is able to disaggregate data by sex and age. And we're able to collect uh, data uh, that includes uh, patients that were seen at the static clinic and during outreaches. Um, it's also able to collect a summary of a diagnosis, including refractive errors, uh, the glasses supplied, and surgical procedures. And this data that we collect on a monthly basis, uh, we are able to analyze it on a quarterly basis and six month, uh, six month uh, basis, and again annually. And from this, we are able to show the trend. And we use these reports for planning and for advocacy. Um, I'm happy to inform you that some partner hospitals have also started seeking feedback from their patients regarding their experiences at the eye unit and mainly on customer care service to improve customer care. And this data, again, we analyze it and use it to improve on the quality of services being provided. Uh, over the years, we have noted improvement on, on the reporting, and um, this could be as a result of the project monitoring system that we put in place from the beginning of the project. Um, as I surgeons are also encouraged to record their surgical outcomes. Um, and they are now conducting, uh, they are monitoring their cataract uh, surgical outcomes. And this data is analyzed to show trends in quality of cataract surgery. Uh, and again, this data is used to make, I mean, this report, once analyzed, is used to make decisions on where to invest uh, when it comes to in, uh, improving quality of services. So the second um, component I'd want to look at when it comes to sustainability is on health financing. And just to give you an overview of health financing in Kenya, yeah, uh, I'd like to mention that Kenya for a long time has employed user fee system in health financing. And in recent years, the government opened up national hospital insurance fund, which is commonly known as NHIF. So NHIF registers all eligible members, both in the informal and informal sector, and it is compulsory for those uh, uh, in the formal sector. But the membership is open and voluntary for those in the informal sector and retirees. So senior citizens aged 65 years and above and people with disabilities benefit from the free NHIF cover. And this NHIF cover, uh, it covers both inpatient and outpatient, including surgeries, up to USD 5,000 on pre-authorization. So Operation Eyesight supported hospitals have uh, both uh, the health financing system in place, uh, that is the user fee and HNIF. And we have been able, again, to negotiate for subsidized fee for cataract surgery in all our partner hospitals to reduce barrier to access due to cost. The other thing that we do is to support the hospitals to provide the free surgical eye pumps to reach the poor populations in remote areas. 
uh, though Though we provide, uh, I mean, uh, we support items, the number visiting the static clinics have increased over the years. Um, it is also uh, important for me to mention that we have introduced a revolving fund for optical services in some of our partner hospitals. And while these um, services, the optical services, are free and open to the general public, we are also we have also tapped uh, NHIF cover in some of them. And we are trying to sensitize the elderly people to take up the NHIF cover as it has recently started covering the uh, cost of surgery. The third component in, um, on sustainability I want to talk about is on human resource for eye health. And uh, this project uh, supports capacity building of hospital partners through training of organic workers. Um, the project, in collaboration with the hospital management, is able to identify gaps in human resource. And we are able also to identify people who are interested in pursuing courses in ophthalmology. And over the years, as I, start, as I had mentioned in my introduction, we have been able to support training of clinical officers and general uh, and uh, ophthalmic nurses. So after the completion of the training, these people are deployed to their stations, some to initiate eye care services in their hospitals, while others to join an existing existing team. So the trained ophthalmic workers are government staff, and they will continue providing services long after the funding comes to an end. Um, the fourth component I'd want to talk about, and actually the last, is the supply chain. And just to give you an overview of what's happening here in Kenya, government hospitals procure their supplies from the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency, commonly known as KEMSA. And in 2016, KEMSA revised its list to expand the essential drugs list uh, for eye drops after concerted advocacy by eye care NGOs in Kenya. And also to mention that um, we have a strong INGO forum uh, in Kenya that's made up of um, other eye care NGOs like Fred Hollow, SciSaver, CBM, and COEXA. And we are able to identify issues on advocacy and run with them. We are also lucky that we work closely with Organic Services Unit, which is a unit of the uh, Ministry of Health, who actually has been holding our hand um, to show uh, and also help us in engaging uh, the ministry. So operationalizers supported eye, uh, eye units have started including eye drops uh, in the hospital order, as these are now available at KEMSA. However, we are experiencing some uh, challenges in that uh, some consumables like the cataract kits, um, uh, trachoma kits, IOS, are not available at cancer. Uh, but we have an intensified advocacy with the county government so that we can prioritize the eye needs of eye health. But also, we are trying to connect uh, the county government to possible suppliers for these consumables and IOLs so that you can be able to purchase them long after the, uh, the funding comes to an end. So in conclusion, I just want to mention that making a project sustainable is a process. It has to start from the very beginning of the project conception and design, as I earlier mentioned. It has to continue throughout the project implementation and I'd want to say that even after the funding has come to an end, uh, it's important to pursue it to ensure that the, that the gains of the project are not lost. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Alice. That was a really interesting presentation, um, especially in the areas of embedding the program into the existing health system and engaging with the National Hospital Insurance Fund. And thank you for sharing such a great advocacy success. It really shows the impact of NGOs in country coming together for joint advocacy. So thank you so much for that, Alice. Secondly, 
Thank you. Let me introduce Deborah Tagheri, who is the country representative for CBM Zimbabwe. So I'm now going to make Deborah the presenter and hand over the controls to her, and she'll take you through her presentation. So again, if you sort of just bear with me a minute. Um, right. uh, give controls to Deborah. The mouse always takes us to win. Right. Okay. So Deborah, I should be making you the presenter. It just sort of takes a, a moment or two just to click through. It's waiting to view Deborah's screen. Yeah, sorry for this slight delay. It's sort of always just takes a when you on go to webinar, it just takes a moment just for kind of the screen to come through, but um, it should be worth it in the end. Yeah, and I think Deborah, if you've had a little box come up saying to accept the screen, then um, you can just click on accept and it should come through. All right. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome, everyone. Yes, my name is Deborah Tigere. I'm the CBM country representative in Zimbabwe. I'm going to uh, talk about sustainability, which is our topic for today, but uh, sharing our experiences on the SIB project um, implemented in Zimbabwe. Okay. Right, I'm going to give you a background of the eye health conditions in Zimbabwe. According to the National Eye Health Strategy 2014 to 2018, um, eye health diseases or conditions are amongst the top five causes of outpatients department and also a major cause of morbidity. And the blindness prevalence is estimated at 1% of the total population, of which more than 80% is avoidable, and cataract alone causing blindness in 62,500 births. This is according to the WHO estimates. Now the SI project in Zimbabwe started in 2015 and it is in its year of implementation and it is of course titled Strengthening Vision 2020 in Northeast Zimbabwe, um, supporting three eye units, uh, namely Norton Eye Hospital in Mashonaland West Province, uh, Sakuba Eye Hospital in Manikaland province and um, the Sekurukaguri Children's Eye Unit which is based in Harare and a major uh, tertiary referral center. Now this project has four objectives which are of course increasing the quantity and improving the quality of eye care services for adults and children. Um, another objective which focuses on the capacity building capacity of eye health workforce at primary, secondary and tertiary levels, uh, as well as the infrastructure for delivery at a secondary and a tertiary level. This is mainly the reconstruction or refurbishment of the specific eye units I talked about. And of course the last objective being to ensure that all eye care services are inclusive. Now, Deborah, let's talk about sustainability. Uh, Deborah, could I just jump in a second? Um, are you able to click through your slides? Um, because I think we, we can view your screen. So are you able to click through whilst you're speaking so we yes. can have a look at the screen that you're kind of speaking on at each time? Sure. Um, I am actually scrolling through my slides. I don't know whether it's showing from that end. No, it's not. Okay. No, no problem. I might take back control and do it from my side. Okay. It's showing now. Uh, show screen. Mm, no, it's not. Uh, okay. I might bring it back to me and then I can then click through. Um, okay. Sorry about that. It's just no, no, so don't, my, no. My fault. Um, if you uh, people show my screen, yeah, okay. Uh, so please continue, and I'll bring up the screen. 
Okay, that's fine. If you can bring up. Sorry about that. Uh, participants, I will talk about sustainability. The ability to maintain services or benefits beyond the lifespan of the project. Now, the major challenge when it comes to sustainability in developing countries uh, is the issue of ownership uh, of the projects, uh, the issue of policy support, um, economic challenges, among other environmental and external threats. Um, and as um, my other colleague talked about earlier on, it is important to consider sustainability right from the design stage through implementation as well as monitoring. But what is it that we want to try and sustain? We need to sustain some level of service provision beyond the lifespan of the project. We need to consider positive change and see whether it can be sustainable. Consider new initiatives and look at whether these new initiatives can also be sustainable. An important aspect to consider when it comes to sustainability as well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the ownership. The ownership of the project objectives or the achievements. And under SIB project in Zimbabwe, in order to achieve ownership, we involved the Ministry of Health and Child Care right from the design to the implementation as well as the monitoring of the project. Um, the partners involved also participated in the National Prevention of Blindness Committee, which is the national committee that looks at eye care services in Zimbabwe. We also involved the, the, the patients in terms of the patient satisfaction survey, which is being administered at the three eye units in order to get continuous feedback on service provision and on ways on how to improve our services, addressing gaps and issues related to the services provided in these three eye units. Coordination and awareness um, is important because we realized that in the provinces which we relied on in terms of identification, screening and referral of patients, they did not understand the project from the onset. So it was important for us to hold coordination meetings, raise awareness for them to get, have a buy-in in terms of what the project was all about and what the objectives were all about in order to support uh, the project implementation, and also to see the vision beyond the project. An important aspect of sustainability is financial or economic sustainability. And each time we think about sustainability, we always think about the financial sustainability because it plays a very important uh, role in terms of how the services will be provided and the ultimate goal. Now, when we talk of financial economic sustainability, we need to consider the project budget and whether the project budget has actually achieved its purpose. We are basically saying with a very minimal budget, which does not achieve the purpose, it's not become very difficult to about sustainability. Now, I'm happy to say that the SIB uh, project was very comprehensive. It looked at the provision of consumable drugs, equipment, instruments, training of ophthalmic nurses, the training of technicians. Um, so it was quite comprehensive, refurbishment of eye units. And I think it served its purpose. Now, in Zimbabwe, we have a policy, a health policy, that states that children under five years and adults above 65 years can access health services in general including eye health services for free. However, under the SIB project, we also managed to negotiate fee the fee structure with each individual hospital to make eye care services affordable in the context of the SIB project on condition that we were providing consumables, we were training the health personnel, we were providing equipment, and hence, this took longer than expected However, it was important to think about it and to ensure that it was implemented if we were going to increase the number of people accessing services and also push for sustainability in the long term. For example, we managed to negotiate the fee for uh, cataract eye uh, surgery for children from $400 to $40. 
in order to enable an increase in the access to service, eye health services. In the short term, yes, we managed to achieve our recovery uh, by increasing the access to services. But this is something that we need to consider and think about more as we come to the end of this project. Now, the ability of the government to take up its services initiated during the project funding is important. It is crucial. Power is currently experiencing um, economic challenges, mainly cash shortages, a high cost of living, which has affected the number of people accessing eye health services. And for us to think that the government will take up these services in the short term uh, might be very tricky. In fact, we need to consider continuous funding through uh, medium term and see if we can achieve financial economic sustainability. Ideally, the government is supposed to be providing consumables in this hospital and it has not been forthcoming because the, of the uh, economic constraints. Hence, the project has had to take over uh, such provisions. In Zimbabwe, we have a non-communicable uh, diseases department under the Ministry of Health and Child Care. And recently, uh, we have had a review of national health strategy 16 to 2020, and um, in this national strategy, they have prioritized NCD or non communicable diseases as priority number two. However, we also notice that there's very little emphasis on eye health as compared to um, diseases like cancer. The Ministry of Health and Child Care, I must say, I commend them for also providing an essential resource or supporting an essential resource, which is the human resource, um, as well as other utilities. We have also had to capitalize on support systems, for example, the health information system and other finance support systems. So I must say this is important when it comes to uh, sustainability. Now, thinking about services without subsidy is very difficult at this stage, like I mentioned earlier on, because of the current political and economic situation. However, potential funding is still necessary in the midterm. What the project also tried to achieve was reducing the patient out-of-pocket payments, for example, the cost of transport um, for patients, and ensuring that the eye care services are well coordinated by having a coordinator situated in all these eye units to ensure that a patient doesn't travel all the way to a hospital for cataract surgery without knowing or understanding what they're looking forward to, hence wasting their uh, much earned uh, little income. Um, we also uh, supplied a vehicle to support the referral of patients from featherless districts also out to the poorest communities in order to reduce their out-of-pocket pay uh, payments and at the same time ensuring that they um, um, also get cataract surgery. In Zimbabwe, we have a failed health insurance. We don't even think about health insurance it's not formally employed and contributing towards one. So it becomes very difficult for patients to access services if you're not formally employed and contributing towards a health insurance system. Now, looking at institutional uh, sustainability, another component of sustainability, um, under the SIB project, we looked at policy, in other words, the development or the design of the SIB project was not out of context in terms of the national eye health strategy in Zimbabwe, and this is important each time we think about uh, sustainability. You need to look at the existing policies. However, of course, in as much as our government is facing uh, economic constraints, the budget may not be forthcoming. But the fact that we have good policies, you never know in the long run when there is a good economic turnaround, there can be a provision made to support um, eye health services. All I'm saying is policy priorities should be consistent with the project objectives or the project design. The training of uh, health personnel took place at primary level where we were targeting the village health workers. Uh, which who are an important cadre in the primary health structure in Zimbabwe in terms of awareness 
the identification and referral of patients. We also trained ophthalmic nurses in the various distal provinces on refraction and diagnostic skills in order to enhance these skills and also support the referral to tertiary, as well as to ensure that patients who require uh, cataract surgery um, are actually attended to. At tertiary level, we trained uh, ophthalmic nurses and ophthalmologists on low vision training. I must say that under the SIB project, this was a new initiative. In Zimbabwe, we did not have low vision services for children. Hence, with this project, we have managed to achieve a new initiative, which I see going beyond the lifespan of the project. The project basically used the existing primary health structure in terms of identification referral, as well as, as I mentioned earlier on, the existing health information system. So we did not invent the wheel. We did not create parallel, parallel structures. We also capitalized on the cataract surgical outcome report, which is used by ophthalmologists to monitor the quality of surgery. I'm happy to say that we now have in-country statistics when it comes to eye care. This was because of the rapid assessment of avoidable blindness research that was conducted in, 20, uh, in 2016. And we are still to share the results as soon as they are endorsed by the ministry. For years, we have been referring to WHO estimates. And through this RAB survey, we will be able to inform future planning and also use it as a proxy to determine um, uh, objectives or activities that need to be implemented in terms of eye care services. We also improved the existing facilities, which is the easier part when it comes to sustainability, in terms of refurbishment of the eye units, reconstruction of one of uh, the biggest eye units in Mashonal and West Province, and I see this improving the quality of services provided, the space that is there, the floor of patients. We have also involved the disabled people's organizations in Zimbabwe to conduct an accessibility audit of these um, units to ensure that different impairments or different types of uh, disabilities um, are, are included into uh, these people with different impairments are able to access services in these refurbished or reconstructed eye units. Now, the provision of equipment and instruments was one other uh, factor that we included under the SIB project in Zimbabwe. And the most importantly, we also trained uh, instrument technicians because there's always the issue of the room of broken toys, where each time you get to an eye unit, they open this room and it's full of broken slit lamps, probably that need just a bulb replacement. And in order to ensure sustainability and improvement in terms of quality services and provision, we ensure that at least three technicians were trained under the SIB uh, to cater for the repairs and maintenance of ophthalmic equipment and instruments. And I must say these technicians are not just going to be restricted to the three eye units where they're currently stationed, but will provide a service to the eye units in Zimbabwe as a whole. Now, when it comes to the supply chain, I mentioned earlier that the, pro uh, the project also provided drugs and consumables, uh, the cataract kits. We relied mainly on the importation of cataract kits from Oralab India. We had challenges initially in terms of importation of these cataract kits because of the Medicines and Control Authority of Zimbabwe regulations. For uh, suppliers to supply drugs in Zimbabwe, they have to be accredited by the MCAZ. And it took time for one of our big suppliers, which is Oralab in India, to be accredited. But uh, with the partnership with the Ministry of Health and Child Care and through the NPBC uh, meetings, we managed to have a breakthrough on this. However, because of the restrictions, not all IK drugs can be imported. As a result, we also rely a lot on local procurement to complement these cataract kits. In addition, we have what we call the Adlers list, which is the essential drug list in Zimbabwe. What we also realized was that they were not prioritizing eye care drugs. 
As a result, the national pharmaceutical company in Zimbabwe did not have most of these drugs in store. So already there was a challenge. But I must say that we have managed to achieve the number of cataract surgeries based on the importation of these cataract kits and complementing with local procurement. However, I believe that through advocacy efforts with the Ministry of Health and Child Care in conjunction with the MCAZ, we can actually achieve more in terms of having more surveys accredited by MCAZ. Now when it comes to social cultural uh, sustainability, um, we managed to promote community participation. I talked about the trainings conducted by the village health workers as part of the awareness and also to promote identification and acceptance by the patients. You find that when not everybody is willing to go uh, for surgery, there is always this barrier, one of it being fear. And in order to address this barrier, we really capitalized on this important cadre uh, who is recognized in the communities, well respected. And according to the uh, primary health strategy in Zimbabwe, you find that of course, they are trained on eye care, but also trained on uh, maternal health, they are trained on ENT, they are trained on a number of issues. So they are a well-respected cadre in the community, and we train the same cadre in order to achieve awareness, identification of eye care, so eye care um, conditions, as well as to promote referral at lower levels. I also mentioned earlier that we involved the DPOs, um, in terms of uh, the accessibility, but also in terms of uh, raising awareness and promoting inclusive practices in the uh, project implementation. Uh, in terms of the community eye health training uh, that was uh, that took place under the SIB project, which involved the cataract case finding, we did not reinvent the wheel. In fact, we used a model that has worked well in other provinces. Uh, Vision 2020 supported provinces, um, we used the same model to train the ophthalmic nurses who were to train the village health workers in that case finding. So it has worked very well. And also established linkages with other provincial Vision 2020 programs in order to strengthen the referral of pediatric patients. In Zimbabwe, we have two pediatric eye units. One of them which was supported by SIV in Harare, which serves the northern part of the country. So in order to send in the referral of patients to this unit, we had to establish linkages with other Vision 2020 programs, and it has worked very well. In order for them to be aware of the services being provided, for example, the Law Vision, which was not there initially, but they are now aware that we have Law Vision services in Zimbabwe at uh, Sekuru Kagubi Children's Eye Unit. Um, of course, under social and cultural sustainability, we have worked very well with the local bank, the local standard chartered bank in country. Um, they have participated a lot in terms of uh, the development of the patient management system, awareness, um, the design and development and production of IEC material, which was non-existent. Uh, but a lot of IT material. So we have a very good relationship with them. And you know, the Standard Bank um, motto is we are here for good. And we believe that if they're here for good, and the fact that they have a soft spot for eye health, uh, this is a partnership that has to be considered in the long term in terms of sustainability. In I would like to say that um, each time we think about sustainability, have to know that this depends on the nature of the project and it has to be included right from the design stage. And of course, it is important to consider other cross-cutting issues such as gender, equity, good governance or poverty alleviation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah. That was a really insightful overview of the sustainability strategies that this project is implementing. Um, now, we've got a little bit of time before the end of this webinar for the question and answer session. So for those of you, we've got, a, um, we've got over 30 people who've attendees. So if you're one of the attendees and you have a question either for Alice or Deborah, if you can please now type it in the chat box. And then what I'll do is I will, um, I'll then give the questions to 
to Alice and Deborah. So if you've got any questions, please, this is your opportunity now to um, send them across to everyone. And while you're thinking of your questions, I'm just going to pull out a couple of points that I thought were quite interesting across the, um, the two presentations. Because what I thought was interesting to me was that there were some common sustainability themes across the two presentations. Sort of firstly, that both projects are embedding all as you know, um, all aspects of the project in the existing health system. So rather than replicating systems, they're sort of embedding it within the existing system, especially at the community and primary health levels, which is so important as often these levels of staff can help raise awareness within the community, they're based in the community, and also help with case finding and referral upwards, and it's a system that's already established and so it can continue on an ongoing basis. Um, secondly, the second theme that I thought was common across both was around advocacy to increase government support for eye care within the country. So with CBM Zimbabwe using um, the RAB to raise awareness of the need and with Operation EyeSight um, working with the other NGOs to get eye drops included into the CHEMSA list. And then thirdly, the fact that both projects are engaging with various income streams. So by thinking about how to support the hospitals to work with the health insurance schemes within the countries and how those health insurance schemes are working within the countries, um, as well as successfully advocating, advocating um, for hospitals to reduce their surgery costs. So therefore making the services more accessible for patients. Um, so they were sort of some of the common themes, but I'm sure that quite a few of you have got some, a few sort of questions. Um, I can see that we've got a couple of come in, so I'm just going to start with um, one who's from Robin. Thank you, Robin, for that. Um, and actually, it's a question for Alice, which is, um, what, were the, what was the uptake by the clinical officers and nurses for the training? and what factors made the training attractive? So Alice, I'm just, I'm going to unmute you. So do you, would you be able to take that question from Robin? Uh, yes, um, the uptake has been good. Um, we have seen uh, people who are interested in taking up ophthalmology in Kenya. Uh, what we did, we worked with the hospital and management and identified the gaps in HR in the eye unit and some, for instance, um, we identified they needed two more of them with nurses. So we asked the hospital management um, to help us identify these health workers. And it wasn't a problem at all. We had them coming forward and applying for the course at the, we have a training um, college called Kenya Medical Training College that offers these diploma courses. And they applied and they were admitted and they attended. So we've not had any challenges. Uh, for uptake of those courses here. Robin, uh, Susan. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. That's great. Um, and one of the questions, actually, that one of the things that came across to me quite strongly in the presentations was just around that you'd both worked with. It's a question for both of you, really, because you'd actually both worked um, with the hospitals to sort of convince them how to um, uh, lower their surgery costs. Um, I mean, uh, the one thing that sticks in my head, Deborah, when you said from like 400 to 40 dollars, which is a huge reduction. So, could you talk a little bit, both of you, um, maybe if we start with Deborah this time and then Alice, about how you managed to go through that process of um, of uh, with the host working with the hospitals to um, reduce their costs and also secondly did the hospitals since they've done that did they value that have they seen sort of numbers rise and then therefore they think yes that that's that's a positive thing to do so Deborah do you okay. want to take that first yes sure um, it was a process I must say of course negotiating with these different hospitals so this was three different eye units we had to negotiate with and of course you'd be dealing with the hospital administration where you have the accountants also doing their maths to see whether it makes sense. But they appreciate the fact that at the moment because of the, uh, the economic constraints that the government is facing and the fact that they have been unable to provide uh, basic consumables to support the provision of services, uh, we had to also come in at the project and say, look, we are going to be providing you with consumables, we are going to be providing you with the drugs, we want to give you the equipment, we are training the health personnel, can you at least uh, lower this structure? And 
there was an indication already in terms of the statistics. Um, the number of people who are accessing uh, services then was very low and now there has been an increase and I must say they do appreciate uh, the contribution from the project and I'm sure they are also not regretting the fact that they had to sign these MOUs to ensure that the fee structure uh, was lowered to enable um, an increase in the access to services. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Alice, over to you. The same same question about how did you work with the hospitals and and how do they see that change that's happened because of lowering the fees? I don't think it's any different from what Deborah has uh, mentioned. Um, it's just engaging with the hospitals uh, from the very beginning at the uh, uh, program inception and just mentioning to them that we are going to provide them with attract kids, uh, the drugs, equipment, train their human resource, and therefore to make their services accessible to the poor and, um, you know, who are in the villages most, because most of our programs are actually in the rural areas, then um, we negotiated that they lower this cost. So um, it was more of a similar process, and again, um, it's something we always do every time we are going to a new uh, area. Thank you. That's interesting. So there's an awful lot there about agreements to be made at the beginning of the of setting up these programs that help kind of get that commitment from people. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder out to the attendees. Um, we've probably only got about eight minutes left. So if you do have a question, I can see we've got quite a few questions popping up now. So if you do have a question, please type it in the chat box now. So so you get your chance to ask your question because I wouldn't want you to miss out. So we've got a question from Juliana Nath Nath Nathaniel, um, which was around, I think it's possibly more to do with, with Deborah, um, but Alice do jump in if uh, it's also related to you, but I, it, the question is, what was the criteria for you to determine children to benefit from the transport support? Because I think you mentioned in some cases you were sort of providing transport support, so what was your criteria to decide which children would get that support? Deborah, do you okay, want to take um, that? Yeah, sure. The, the, the transport that we were providing basically is a vehicle, um, vehicles in the provinces. In fact, under the SI, I just had one vehicle for Manikaland province. We did manage to get another vehicle for the other province. The focus was on increasing the number or uh, the number of cataract output um, in the two provinces. So it wasn't specifically for children, but the referring of patients from the furthest distance the poorest communities, reaching out and bringing them to the base hospital for cataract surgery in order to increase the cataract uh, surgical output. So it was mainly to increase the cataract surgical output from these uh, districts that were further, uh, where people are poor. And this coordination was done th uh, through the district ophthalmic nurses who had been trained. And remember, I talked about the awareness raising in the districts and the provinces so that everybody would be aware of the services provided with the support of SIB project. And through that, they managed to reach, working with the village health workers, those who are so much in need, who can't even afford to pay uh, uh, for transport to access cataract surgery. And these are the patients who were brought in by the vehicle in order to reduce the patient out-of-pocket payments. Thank you. So that's really interesting that, again, you're working with the key people working in those areas, you know, the ophthalmic nurses and the community health workers to work. So it was sort of to think about those who are far and those that are from the um, sort of from the poorer areas. That's really interesting. And Alice, did um, within your project, were you providing transport support to children or adults? And if so, how did you determine which ones who would benefit from that? Uh, for us, we have a different approach uh, to, to reach the people on the ground. We actually take the team. We have a, 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 a field vehicle that takes the surgical team to, to the nearer to the people. So we identify a hospital. It could be a faith-based organization hospital or a sub-county hospital with a theatre. Uh, and then people around that hospital are mobilized um, 
probably prior to the out, outreach team. And then those who had been identified with cataract uh, cases or any other surgical cases are brought to that hospital and the team conduct their surgeries there. So for us, we don't ferry the patients to the hospital, but rather bring the surgical team nearer to the, to the people. Okay, so, thank you. Okay. That's interesting. Um, okay, so we've got another few questions that have come through. They're sort of coming thick and fast now, which is lovely. So again, do send us your question if you're interested. Um, I've got a question for Alice actually from Anne Ebry. Um, and she's saying, um, she's asking Alice, are um, spectacles costs covered by the NHIF? And if so, at what percentage? Um, the NHIF uh, spectacles currently is com covering the, the civil servants. Those are mainly um, government uh, people who are working in government uh, institutions. And it covers uh, the full cost, uh, not a percentage. Um, and I think it goes up to about, uh, uh, let me just do a quick calculation up to about uh, $200. But we also are trying now to ensure that um, this is open to everybody. Um, so even when it's just open to a section of, I mean, a group of people is good enough because it was not there at all. But now that is an entry point to ensure that it's open to everybody. Great, thank you, that's Great. lovely. Um, we've got a couple of questions about advocacy here, so I'm going to read both questions and then one is for Alice and one is from Deborah. So uh, Deborah, I'll, I'll do the question, I'll do the two together and then we'll do Deborah first and then Alice. So I've got a question from Herbert Dola for um, Deborah, which is talking about advocacy. So he's asking, how did the Zimbabwe team manage to convince the um, government with, you, with the supply to Oh, actually, this is valid because it's around um, including the eye drugs in the supply chain. So um, I think it's also relevant for you, Deborah, as well, because you did do a lot of work with the government to kind of get the importation of um, goods. So it's sort of around how did you work for both of you, really? How did you do that advocacy with the government and how do you work with them to, I suppose, for the Zimbabwe project, um, uh, get the importation of materials and then for the Kenya team to get the inclusion of eye drops into the, um, the sort of government drug list. So Deborah, shall we start with you? Yes, um, yes, we did a lot of advocacy with the Ministry of Health and Child Care regarding that, um, who were very supportive and in agreement to ensuring that we get adequate supplies of eye care drugs. However, the challenge was the a regulatory body which is the medicines and control authority of Zimbabwe and when it comes to regulations and drugs you cannot break the rules so we had to do it the right way we had to engage the supply, supplier to meet with the medicines and control authority of Zimbabwe and enable um, a site visit and certification of the supply so in as much as we did a lot of advocacy, but we also had to do it the right way because of the regulatory body. And we had to make sure that the supplier was accredited. However, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is need to still do more because we have all these other drugs that are not on the ed list, list of drugs, priority drugs in Zimbabwe uh, for us which we believe, if that was the case, then we wouldn't be struggling with importation of uh, drugs. Thank you, Deborah. Um, okay, Alice, over to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about the advocacy that you did within Kenya? Um, for us, um, uh, this process started some time back, and, um, and I remember around 2013, we presented a list of, uh, uh, list of the, uh, eye drops uh, to the Ophthalmic Services Unit, and especially for child eye health, when um, this, that was supported actually by Sin is Believing, uh, when we were actually engaging the hospitals and asking them if they could provide uh, the drugs. And the first question they're asking, how can we provide these drugs? We don't know where to, to purchase them from. KEMSA doesn't have them. So we presented this list to the 
so family services unit and uh, uh, and presented of course our challenge and again as i said it is a concerted effort by other ngos i know for instance the fred hollows foundation and others have also been pushing for the same and uh, and, and we have also been discussing this during our our uh, INGO forum uh, as one of the issues that you need to push for. So it's until 2016 that the ministry actually came back to us and said now the list has been included. So that has been the process, but I can say it, it has taken long, but of course uh, we are happy that eventually it, it happened. Lovely, thank you, and congrats. Um, I've got a question here for um, for both of you from Bo Wiafi. Um So he's asking. Um, basically, he says thank you both for both of the presentations. You've articulated it very well. Um, but his question is, how in your projects, how do you manage to keep your staff? Because this is a challenge for many programs, and I think it's sort of um, how do you sort of stop stop staff from leaving the projects, and how do you kind of cope? How does a project cope with staff retention? So, um, should we start with Deborah and then go on to Alice? Uh, sure. Um, staff retention is a challenge, especially for Zimbabwe, considering the economy. Uh, where we have experienced a uh, brain drain. Um, we do have ophthalmologists, yeah, and more being trained, but the probability of keeping them in country <laughs> might be very low. However, what we tried to do through the project, there was a lot of training, especially for ophthalmic nurses. Um, this is also more of an incentive uh, where, you know, they, they become more involved, um, it becomes an incentive for them to be trained and the fact that they were also involved in new initiatives such as the RAB and received some certificates for that was also an incentive for them. Um, I also found the project very interesting but I cannot guarantee staff retention in Zimbabwe or in eye health. Um, it is a big challenge and will remain to be a big challenge if the uh, current economic situation does not change. Thanks, Deborah. And Alice, over to you on the same question about how do you should retain staff and keep them engaged in the project? Yeah, um, surprisingly, yes, this is supposed to be a challenge, but uh, I've been in this program, I'm working for Operation ISAID for the last five years, and we have uh, retained the people that I found there. They are still there working with the government. And one of the ways of uh, motivating and, of course, giving them great incentive is we support them for continuous professional development. Um, we support, like, uh, the, the ophthalmic work, I mean, the, the ophthalmologists or the cataract surgeons, even the, the nurses to attend the ophthalmic conferences in the country and sometimes outside the country, where they attend and present their own papers. The other uh, motivation that I've seen of something that is making them stay uh, where they were posted is, um, is that most of them work in, in their home areas, in, within their counties. Uh, and so because they have their families there, so the issue of moving out, I'm not seeing it. But probably, yes, it's a problem in other areas, but uh, I've not experienced it. Great. Thank you, Alice. Okay. Um, we're a little bit over time, but we have so many questions coming up. I'm sort of reluctant to end just yet, so we might just take a couple of quick questions finally, and then we'll wrap things up. And if you do have questions, obviously, um, you can email me and I can pass them on to our presenters after. Um, but a couple of sort of final questions. We've got one from uh, Joseph Magezi, um, which is for both both Deborah and Alice. Um, he wants to know a little bit about follow-up. So from when patients have had the treatment, um, either the surgeries or the spectacles, what kind of follow-up are they kind of coming back into? Um, what, what's, what's kind of follow-up and how does that, how is the follow-up for patients working within the projects? Um, so again, if we start with Deborah and then go on to Alice to give you each bit of time to go through that. Okay, okay. Um, in Zimbabwe, under the SIB project, in order to strengthen the aspect of follow-up, um, we developed, in partnership with the local bank, the patient management system. 
to ensure that you know we wouldn't drop our patients, we would know when the patients are supposed to return, and because we had the coordinators in these various units coordinating the project, these are the people responsible for uh, rem sending reminders to the patients, uh, following up and uh, when it comes to the cataract surgery, which is important when it comes to follow-up, um, the, of course, we always have the day one visual acuity check and the patient is discharged. Then we have the two weeks, which means the patient is supposed to come back at two weeks uh, post uh, visual acuity as well as the six weeks post visual acuity. This has been uh, happening in the three I units. However, like I mentioned earlier, the challenge has always been the transport especially when this surgery has been done and there is, everything is perfect, it's very unlikely that that person, if they don't have money, will return back for um, post-op VA at two weeks and six weeks. However, what we did was we raised awareness with the village health workers so that they could continuously send out this message in terms of the importance of follow-up. And because the uh, district ophthalmic nurses we also trained to enhance the uh, d diagnostic and refraction skills. They were also capacitated to uh, conduct or to review an assessment of patients so that the patients don't have to travel back to the provincial base hospital, but could be assessed at their local district hospital and only referred when there was need for the ophthalmologist to attend to an issue. So that's how we managed the, the follow-up. But in some cases, for example, for pediatric patients, follow-up was also done uh, using a phone, a telephone or mobile phone, uh, just phoning to find out how the patient is, depending with their condition. Great, thanks Deborah. Um, and uh, Alice, over to you, would you like to talk a little bit about the follow-up that happens for patients within the project? Uh, yes, I think uh, I will agree with the person who has asked that question, that follow-up has been a challenge. But what we have done so far is that we have engaged community health volunteers. These are people who are within the community and have been uh, at the work as the, in, in, in the area of health, and they are trained in primary eye care. And since these people are actually in charge of a certain number of households. I think in Kenya, once the community health volunteer is in charge of about 100 households, so they know once they mobilize these people to come forth for eye services or surgeries, they know them very well. So we are now using them to help us in the follow-up. Again, um, we discussed this issue uh, in our last review meeting, meeting with our partners. Uh, because, uh, as I have said, it has been a challenge. And I have seen some improvement um, uh, uh, since our meeting. I've seen one of the I units now has assigned somebody to do the calls, you know, for, for follow-up, you know, for patients who need uh, reminders to come for, for the follow-up. So I am seeing an improvement in up to two weeks uh, follow-up. Uh, three to six weeks follow-up is still a challenge for us. But I believe um, one thing that we are going to do uh, going forward, and we have agreed this with our partners, is to engage uh, first, is to ensure that follow-up component is part of the program from the very beginning. And then we identify the CHVs who are going to be you know, uh, in, engaged in the program in identification, mobilization, and all that, and also updated and who has come for the surgery, who has not come, and that communication to go on in between the facilities. It's a, uh, a model in, uh, we are trying to also um, introduce in Kenya, uh, uh, Operation Eyesight model, we call it hospital community, uh, hospital based community eye health. This is where we do clustering of uh, a, a district. We identify around the health facility, identify specific uh, community health volunteers who work with us throughout, ensure that we have calmed the area in terms of people who need surgery, the follow-up has been done until the end. So I believe that uh, model will work for us here in Kenya. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Alice. And that's a lovely sort of moment to bring this um, webinar to a close. I would love to continue discussing and talking with all of you um, for the rest of the afternoon, but I know that with some time differences, it's getting quite late for some people. So I'd like to end by thanking our two presenters, Alice and Deborah, for their comprehensive presentations and the responses to all of the sort of varied questions. Um, thank you to my colleague, John, for all the technical support. And thank you to everyone who's participated. I really appreciate you all taking the time to be part of our Seeing as Believing learning community. And if you'd like to share your own sustainability strategies with the Seeing as Believing community, sustainability is one of the themes for the next Seeing as Believing newsletter. So you're welcome to submit articles to me by the end of June. Then I'll include them in the July newsletter. And I have just one final favour. I'm now in the next five to ten minutes or so, I'm going to email all of you a survey on based around the Seeing as Believing webinar. So if you could please just take five minutes to complete it, as your support for these webinars does make them possible, and I think your feedback helps us to improve them and make them more useful and interesting for you. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at future Seeing as Believing webinars. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>